Welcome to New York Studios, where you can come and watch us make the news. Today we have Oliver de Schutter. He's a special UN special representative on the right to food, and he's just finished presenting his final report. Is that correct? Yes, I'm presenting a, a report which is summarizing six years of work on various countries and issues. I've been working in this mandate since 2008. Uh, I took up my mandate, in fact, during the midst of the global food price crisis, and I delivered some 15 reports to the General Assembly of the UN and the Human Rights Council, mm -hmm. and I'm presenting a final report that uh, summarizes the key concerns I have and the key recommendations I make. This is very interesting because it'd be, the, the period that you're taking is one where everyone has gone through tremendous upheavals and every institution has as well. W what have we learned from the last uh, few years in your food Well, crisis? I think it's been an extraordinary five, six last years uh, where the f paradigm shift has been from a concept of food security that was based on more trade and aid and the specialization of each region into a certain range of commodities for which they were better suited um, to a concept of food security that is much more decentralized, in which countries are encouraged to feed themselves rather than to depend on markets and to depend on, on trade and aid. Um, so there's been a massive reinvestment in agriculture, a great insistence both from private uh, actors and from governments to invest in, in small farmers yep. um, with very uneven results, but the discourse certainly has changed significantly. Yeah. I mean, uh, it would be hard to see how in, in the world that we have uh, the results uh, for people who, who are at the bottom of the economic ladder, that the results would be mixed. Have you seen anything that, that really strikes you that, that could be a, a good part of a solution for the future? Well, certainly what uh, is interesting is uh, both a shift in the way consumers behave. They are not interested anymore simply in, in cheap food uh, without any concern for how it's been produced. They increasingly demand food that is sustainably produced, that is um, paying an equitable um, wage to the farmers. Um, and um, I'm also very encouraged to see that uh, farmers are better and better organized. We see farmers' unions emerge. We see them um, um, increasingly participating in the shaping of policies. And this means that the decisions are more transparent, more democratic, than they were in the past. I mean, are, are you finding that, that with more involvement by the producers and by the host countries, it's bringing something that, that, that is actually more sustainable, that we can have more of a planned future? It's uh, very difficult to say that this goes beyond rhetorics and, and discourse. Uh, the reality is that on the ground, uh, governments are not able to effectuate much change because they don't have the financial resources this takes to make up for 35 years of underinvestment in agriculture. Yeah. And so they, they depend on private actors, on mm -hmm. agribusiness corporations, whose agenda may be very different than those of governments, and who still primarily focus uh, large-scale plantations for export markets, rather than um, building uh, the ability for local communities to feed themselves. And so this, this gap between um, the priorities proclaimed in international summits by governments yeah. and what the private sector is ready to deliver is a very important gap. Yeah. I mean, we've seen some quite incredible things. I mean, in, in Kenya, for example, you know, and, and Tanzania, there are huge areas growing flowers for the West, which are being flown out in refrigerated condition. I mean, the carbon footprint apart from anything else must be tremendous. But with this change to more trade and more of the agribusiness coming in, that's got to be a mixed blessing. Well, you see, I'm of the view that we need all types of farming to feed the world. We need, um, uh, certainly we need trade, we need big players who can link consumers to faraway uh, uh, producers and, and that can be very good at achieving economies yeah. of scale in the food processing uh, industry. But we also need local food systems that uh, connect much more closely the local producers to the local consumers and that allow small scale farmers to have much better access to the local markets which are much easier for them uh, mm. to penetrate because they don't face the same obstacles of standards and volumes uh, than if they want to join large um, uh, supply chains. And we need all types of farming. The problem is we've been in the past investing practically only on large scale farms to supply 
the global markets. We've not been investing enough in, in small-scale farms, in family farms, despite the huge importance of these for many communities who, who rely on, on a form of agriculture that is smaller scale, but, but can be extremely um, um, important for local food security. I mean, because, I mean, the production of food through uh, small-scale farming, which is also a, a big thing for, for Europe to do, in itself also shows that the food issue goes beyond mere nutrition it, it goes into societies and cultures and and that um, I'm just wondering because we had a thing a while ago of uh, biofuels being the answer to all our ills and I remember a friend asking the Commission at the time where are you going to grow this mm. and now it seems that we have an answer to where that was grown and how it was going to play out. Could you just tell me a little bit on how well, that affects you? Well, it's an interesting story, biofuels. I think in 2007, 2008, when the policies were put in place, a bit earlier in the US, a bit later in the EU, there was a genuine belief that uh, they were a solution uh, to move to renewable uh, yeah. um, fuels in, in the transport sector in particular. We realize now that the energy um, efficiency of uh, um, these uh, lines of production is not particularly great because it takes lots of energy to produce them. Yeah. Um, we also rely, more importantly, that the impact on land and water resources is very important. Yes, we produce some biofuels in the EU, particularly in Germany and France, uh, from sugar beet, uh, wheat, for example, but we therefore have to import vegetable oils uh, from faraway countries such as Malaysia and, and Indonesia and this has a huge impact on deforestation and on um, uh, putting pressure on the resources in these, in these countries in the south. Um, unfortunately, this impact has been underestimated. It is very important. It's been one of the key factors behind the land grabbing a phenomenon yes. that has developed all over the world and I believe personally that the biofuels policy of the EU should be significantly re-examined but promises were made to investors, investments were made which are now sunk investments mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to change track. Yeah, I mean that's one of the problems that, that, that some of us find in Brussels is it, it's very tempting to find a magic solution and then later find out that it wasn't quite as magic as we thought. I mean, what would you like to see done in Brussels for food nutrition? Because we do a lot in aid and development as well, and we're, we're significant donors. So yeah. you're talking to people who do have real influence. How would you like to see that influence used, perhaps, in a slightly different way? Mm. I, I think uh, we really um, are, are changing from one paradigm to another um, um, in, term in, the, in the question of food security. The, the, the EU agricultural policies were built in the 1960s uh, with a view to produce as much as possible and to, and to basically flood the global markets with heavily subsidized foodstuffs. Mm -hmm. That has damaged agriculture in the south. It has led governments in the developing countries to underinvest in local production yep. because they could not compete against these heavily subsidized uh, um, producers of the EU. Um, we must change this and in part this is happening. Uh, we already have practically phased out export subsidies which were the most damaging yep. subsidies. At the same time we still have an agriculture that is um, uh, distorting the global markets and we uh, are still um, not supporting countries enough to feed themselves in part because we we, we want to buy what they can produce through export-led agriculture and, and we've been not paying enough attention to this. Um, just let me take one example. The, the huge um, impact our livestock production is, is having in the, in the global south. We yeah. use 20 million hectares of land in Brazil, Argentina and some other places to grow soybean to feed our cattle in the EU. Now, this not only means that we are very dependent on Brazil and Argentina, it also means that we are using these land resources um, at the expense of the ability for the local communities to feed themselves better and to practice a type of farming that is more diversified. So the EU should be much more attentive to um, monitoring the impacts of its choices, uh, whether they concern production or consumption, on the developing countries. Okay. I mean, we can, un I, we can understand why Europe did go for big, large amounts of cheap food in the 60s because of the wartime memories and the memories of rationing that we had now. 
But just to remind that, that we are also in trouble rather than being the uh, benevolent donors is we've had a new fee, uh, we've had a new thing arise in Britain of food banks mm. which we're used to talking about food banks in a development context and now we're talking about them in a domestic mm. European context so this is this is these food banks uh, which are playing an increasingly important role for the benefit of the very poorest segments of the population in the EU um, um, have I, I are really a testimony to our failure to provide adequate social protection and to combat inequalities. In fact, in all OECD countries uh, over the past 30 years, since the early 1980s, um, um, inequalities have increased and, and the very poor um, yes, in, in countries such as Spain, Greece, uh, but even the UK um, are increasingly dependent on what is essentially public charity. Um, and that, is my view, is not acceptable. Um, a, a government cannot rely on, on food banks uh, um, to justify its failure to support the poor adequately and to allow them to have an adequate diet. Um, at, you see, for many years we thought that cheap prices would be the answer to to poverty and to ensure that poor families could have access to, to food at an affordable price. But that um, is not a solution. We need to strengthen social protection. We need to um, make it a priority to um, leave no single family behind. And these inequalities have risen to an extent that is becoming extremely uh, problematic in our societies. And finally, as you're, you're, as you're leaving, is, is just if I was your successor, what would your advice be? I, I think really food democracy is key um, and by this I mean something very simple. Uh, when agricultural policies are developed, they are done based on uh, whichever influence lobbies can exercise uh, behind closed doors, uh, um, in the, uh, literally in the lobbies of the, of the European Commission or other places of power. It is not done transparently, it is not done in a participatory fashion and we have agricultural policies, not food policies that integrate the health dimensions, the environmental dimensions that should be part of any decent food policy. In fact, we have agricultural policies, no food policies, and, and uh, we have not built the link between agriculture and other, other areas. So food democracy, um, greater transparency and, ac and accountability in the way decisions are made, and a more holistic approach as a result of bringing other stakeholders in, the shaping of these policies is, in my view, the priority. And um, do you have a lot of hope for the next um, series of commissioners and parliamentarians that they are going to really take this issue up? Well, you know, there's a real demand from the public. Um, even when the Common Agricultural Policy was reformed in 2013, um, despite it being a very technical dossier, um, it, it led to a huge mobilization of citizens far beyond the agricultural sector alone. And I think now consumers demand something else. I think the broader public is expecting that food systems deliver um, in a much more sustainable fashion. And I, I, I think politicians cannot ignore this in the future. So I'm hopeful because I'm sure that politicians can listen. Their best interests, their self-interests uh, would would order them to pay attention to these changing trends in society. Well, Mr. Schutter, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for coming and telling us about this. And I think it's very useful for us all to bear in mind that the right to food, the right to nutrition, is a European right. It's a global right. It affects us as much as it affects people in any other world. So thank you very much for reminding us of this importance.